Greetings. Good day, y'all. Mark Boswell, Boswell Emergency Medical Education Technology here. I'm going to do a little video short for you to go over the most recent practice question I posted. Um, it is practice question 881, and the original question was posted a couple days ago, and the answer just got posted now. And it was a question that has a lot of different teaching points and talking points about it, some of which will be uh, helpful for those preparing for the CE and exam, as well as some practical stuff as well, too. The question did stimulate a lot of conversation and back and forth because it wasn't exactly clear on the situation, and it is a situation that we don't see often in emergency medicine. So I'm going to start with reading you the question, and I'm going to look at my other screen here so I can read it to you verbatim. Um, the question and the answer is posted on the um, web page, so you can refer back to it yourself if you like. Um, but here's the question. Uh, it's question number 881. So an eight-year-old victim of a severe trauma is being cared for. The child is unresponsive and unstable due to suspicion of massive internal bleeding. The attending physician has initiated orders to begin a massive transfusion protocol. The parents are refusing this based upon religious preferences. Which of the following should be anticipated to be done? Choice A, complete an incident report. Choice B, provide the family with a do not resuscitate form. Choice C, provide comfort measures only. Choice D, initiate the massive transfusion protocol. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to give you the answer, and I'll give you the rationale for it, and then we'll dive a little bit deeper into what actually makes it the right answer, okay? So the right answer is D, to initiate the massive transfusion protocol. Um, let's look at the other choices and see if we, if, if we can narrow this down, because usually in a multiple choice exam, it's in a standardized national high-level validated exam, you can usually throw out at least one or two answers that are usually pretty much obviously wrong. So let's look at these and see if we can do that. So completing an incident report, no, not the right answer. That's not something you would do during the care period. That's something we might do after the fact, after whatever happened has happened. And of course, this scenario I'm giving you would be something that there might be some legal or some liability outcomes. Um, and so an incident report does help to doc. What does an incident report basically do? An incident report basically helps your hospital leadership, legal department, your QA, your review processes to identify potential lit litigious or liability issues that can be followed up on. It's an internal document only. It's not something you do at the time of care. It's usually done after the, after the care period. So we're going to get rid of A. It, a is not providing any benefit or any change to that patient's medical condition. Okay? Provide the family with a do not resuscitate form. Well, what is a do not resuscitate form? That is a physician's order. So at first, it's not a family form. It's a physician's order. And yes, I know in some care facilities, hospitals, the family may be helping to fill it out, but it's not, it doesn't become a DNR until it's ordered by the physician, okay? Uh, if a family's filling out a questionnaire or a survey, it's just their input and their thoughts. The physician ultimately has to write an order for us to operate under in that care facility. So that's one reason it's kind of wrong. Another one is do not resuscitate is simply an order stating if the heart stops, if the patient dies, what do we do? Do we begin ALS? Do we begin BLS? What do we do, All right? This child in this question is not dead. This is not an issue at this moment. You could fill out a DNR on anybody, all right? But it has really nothing to do with the question at hand and the point of care we're at with this child. Um, provide comfort measures only. That is an end of life situation, okay? We're talking about resuscitation here, okay? And because D is the right answer, that makes C actually wrong, okay? C is very passive. This is not someone who has a terminal condition, an end-of-life state, things like that. The crux of this question comes down to the ability for the parents to refuse treatment for that child based upon religious preferences. So I did a little research into this, and I'm going to give you some references um, to help substantiate this. Some of the discussion uh, in the discussion box when the question was posted was about well, certain states have this, some have this. I'm going to tell you the overarching care that the government, whether it be state, tribal, or federal, has is child welfare and well-being being is always paramount. It is always paramount. And in some cases, the courts have had to intercede on stuff like this to make decisions for the child. There, is, there are some states, there are some localities that do respect religious choices made by the parents on behalf of a minor. And there are a few, I'm going to say my word, fantastical cases where that has been upheld. I'm going to tell you that is the exception and not the rule, okay? That is a very few and far between. 
of all the cases that have been presented, and I did some research on case law on this, of all the cases that have been presented and tried post facto, overwhelmingly, the state has ruled and sided on the protection and the well-being of that child, overwhelmingly, okay? So that is a, a preponderance of case law that states that. The first case law, if you want to look, up, look this up as well, too, the first case that was brought up in the U.S. Supreme Court was in 1944, Prince versus Massachusetts. Now, if you read the summary, and please don't go to Wikipedia. I mean, find you a legal source, a, a more substantial source, because um, Wikipedia is just going to give you uh, basically the bullet. And you know what we believe about research and evidence-based. You don't read just the bullet. You got to read more into it. Um, but this case law uh, was presented under the guise of child welfare and child labor laws. But the legal principle that came out of this case was that, yes, parents do have autonomous rights to themselves and to speak on behalf of a minor child, but they, they cannot use those rights to threaten a child's well-being or safety. Okay. The court also said the parent, and here's the thing about the whole religious freedom thing. The parent does have a right, a right, an inherent right to follow whatever religious belief system they choose. They don't have a right to impose that upon a minor or to practice. They don't have a right to practice. They have a right to believe. The court was very clear in that. And I think in today's, uh, today's current society, we get those two words kind of mixed up, a right to believe one thing and then a right to do something, okay? And this actually is, is a big legal case definition. You can believe whatever you want, but there may be limitations to you practicing it, okay? And I know that's kind of getting into semantics and legalese, but that's your, that's your initial case law it was 1944, Prince versus Massachusetts. And this has been expanded on many times since then. And again, uh, some high level cases at the state court level, as well as the federal, and again, overwhelmingly, they have erred on the side of protecting the child, even to the point of taking some parents' rights temporarily away. I'm going to give you two other resources for those of you looking at the CEN. Um, as far as, all right, so you may not know case law, but those of you that are getting prepared for the CEN, I want to give you some resources that really fit this as well, too. And I'm going to show them to you here. So when we talk about this, the BCN, the CEN exam, we want to look at authoritative sources where that information comes from. And I've in other videos, I've told you some good resources, some good textbooks, some learning materials to use. And I'm going to pull this out of two of the ones I own and I use and I looked for, okay? So the first one I want to draw your attention to is the ENA Emergency Manual, Manual of Emergency Care, all right? And I can, I'm actually going to read you verse out of here. And this is on, which edition is this? This is the seventh. This is the most recent edition. And it's on page 47. I'm going to read it directly to you verbatim. If a child presents with parent with the parent and essential medical care is refused, protective custody of the child is indicated. Adults, adults have autonomous rights, but they cannot be imposed upon a child, okay? So the parent has the right to speak, but they cannot withhold anything as life or limb saving if it's based upon sound standard medical practice. We're not talking about like some chelation therapy or something. We're talking about a child in this question who every indication is they're bleeding out internally and they need blood products. And we know blood replacement transfusion protocols are evidence-based and they're a standard of care for patients who are hemorrhaging. All right, so that's one reference from you from an ENA sponsored endorsed manual. And I'm gonna tell you a lot of CEN questions come from these two sources I'm telling you right now. The other one is Emergency Nursing Principles and Practice, uh, seventh edition also, all right? And what it states is on page 15, parents may not refuse life, limb, or organ-saving treatment on behalf of their children for religious reasons. And here you go again. Here's, they also cite the case law. In 1944, the U.S. Supreme Court held, quote, parents may be free, may, may be free to become martyrs themselves, but it does not follow they are free in identical circumstances to make martyrs of their children before they reach the age of full and legal discretion when they make it, can make their own choices for themselves. So again, this is right from two resources um, that are intimately involved, authored, reviewed by people that are also involved in writing these CEN questions. Um, so I, I know overwhelmingly the question, you know, people are like, oh, you know, parents' rights as far as religious goes. Yes, that's important. However, and I think this goes to the crux of what we do in healthcare, we always want to do the best reasonable care for the patient, preventing undue suffering, preventing loss of life, we would 
obviously if this situation actually happened, we would want to have a conversation with these parents and explain to them the science behind the current medical practice and what we do, and hopefully come to some understanding there. Um, hopefully it doesn't get to the point of getting law enforcement involved. Some people put in the, the comments under the question, well, you need to get judge's order. We're resuscitating someone. We're not calling, what are you gonna do in the meantime? We have to act in their best interest, okay? So hopefully that gives you some sound references as far as that goes, both from your, your testing references if you're studying for this exam, as well as uh, some of the legal case law. All you gotta do is Google um, Prince versus Massachusetts and you can read some of the links about that and some of the discussions on it. However, the bottom line is this child needs life-saving treatment and that's what you would do to be the best, safest care for this patient at this time. What's the worst case scenario? Do nothing and the child dies and then you're found at possibly some fault for some negligent medical care, all right? And you know, that's, you know, there's monetary damages and criminal and civil things with that, but you can't get that life back, okay? At least if you start, it's almost an example of, it's better to do something and then withhold and say, okay, we're gonna let this go now, rather than having to explain why you didn't do something at all, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Hey, um, it's Memorial Day weekend. Hope y'all are having, oh, it's, it's Monday, it's Memorial Day. Um, hope y'all are having a good one. I gotta get out of here, go do some chores. I hope that helps. I'll post this. Uh, if you didn't get to watch all of it, it'll be online on the Facebook page in a few minutes. And it was kind of unscripted, so I, I'm sorry I kind of stuttered. It didn't really flow that great. But hopefully it gives you some insight and some authoritative answers and rationale behind it. You guys stay safe. Enjoy your Memorial Day, and we'll talk again soon.